Welcome back again, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here with more China History Podcast action. Part two this time of the story of these mostly Hakka, but also Hokkien, Teochew, and Cantonese Gongsis that operated in the province of West Kalimantan from the mid-18th century until the last of them were extinguished in 1884. If you'll permit me, I wanted to give a mention to my Patreon page, all spiffed up and more engaging and enticing than ever. I cordially invite you to join fellow CHP listeners in supporting your humble narrator to keep the content creation mill running at optimum capacity. If you're interested, head on over to the official website at teacup.media for links to everything and everything that I'm up to. From that state-of-the-art portal, you'll be able to access not only my Patreon page, but also other ways to show me some appreciation, my deepest thanks and gratitude. We left off last time with the Dutch abandoning West Borneo during the Napoleonic Wars when the Netherlands had more pressing things on their mind than getting outwitted and outmaneuvered by the Chinese who were working the gold mines of Mandor and Montrado and up in Sambas. There was a small Dutch contingent that remained behind, but they were left to fend for themselves without any replenishment of provisions or supplies, and it stayed that way till about 1806. And while the Dutch were gone, the French, eager to stick it to their enemy Great Britain, tried to assist the Dutch to reestablish themselves in the East Indies, as far as the French saw things. Any pressure they could put on the British in Southeast Asia was always money well spent. But despite France's assistance, Stamford Raffles, from 1811 to 1816, occupied Java and held it until the Convention of London in 1814, which saw the return of all Dutch colonial possessions that were lost beginning in 1803. Well, not everything. The British held on to Cape Town in South Africa. Let me also mention that the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, without ever realizing their dream in West Borneo, was dissolved in 1798, and the Dutch government assumed control of their possessions. And while the VOC was known to resort to violence to get its way, the Dutch government was even more assertive, and as we'll see, less patient with these Chinese miners who seemed most expert in keeping the Dutch at bay and getting away with as much as they had been able to. Just as the Western powers scrambled to restore their colonial possessions after World War II, so it had been following the Napoleonic Wars that ended in 1815. Starting in 1818, the Dutch returned to the East Indies in full force and were as determined as they had ever been to assert their authority over the parts of West Borneo where they claimed control. They were hell-bent on setting up a system that maximized the returns on their investment in that land. And the key to all that rested with the Chinese inhabitants. For the next few decades, what followed was a bumpy, cobblestone road of excruciating negotiations filled with deceit, misunderstandings, agreements made and broken, and the occasional militant flare-ups. The Dutch were as determined as they had ever been to maximize how much they could extract from the Chinese gongsis, and the gongsis were equally determined to not give in to these demands. The Dutch authorities were setting up their own government infrastructure in West Borneo and were most insistent that the Gongsis become part of this. But the Gongsis themselves already had their own well-run and efficient government and administration, and they only wished to be left alone. The last thing they wanted was to surrender to the Dutch this good thing that they had established for themselves. During the Napoleonic Wars, when the attention of the British and Dutch was not focused on Southeast Asia, the Gongsis after a 27-year absence of the Dutch beginning in 1791, had perhaps the greatest period of prosperity and wealth creation in their history. And the sultans, who had so antagonized the Chinese at first and who had laid down an endless stream of demands, now, by 1818, were actually beholden to the Gongsis. And though there was no love lost between the Chinese and the Malays in West Borneo, they still got along 
One interesting thing concerned the interaction of the Chinese miners and the Dayaks, though often at odds with each other and with violence sometimes following in the wake of their many disagreements. An interesting dynamic that existed was in the betrothal of Dayak women as wives for the Chinese men. You know, this early in Chinese immigration history, it was still a well-known fact that a lot of men and very few women had fanned out across Southeast Asia. And so these men in West Borneo did what came naturally, and the common thing to do was to marry a Dayak woman. These marriages, in some ways, bound the Chinese and Dayaks to each other and created a kind of subculture that kept a modicum of peace and tranquility between these two groups and allowed for a tolerance of each other that otherwise might not have existed. These Dayak women became full-fledged partners with their Chinese husbands, providing for them and giving voice to matters that affected them, and their offspring were referred to as Ban Tang Fan, which, if you break down the characters, means half Chinese and half Aboriginal. As the Dutch returned to Borneo, as well as to their other colonial possessions, of course, they began to reassert themselves. And amongst the Chinese who were living and working in West Borneo, especially coming out of so many years of economic prosperity, the He Shun Zong Ting and the Lang Fang Gong Si were far and away the two most formidable entities that the Dutch had to be wary of. In June of 1818, the Dutch sent an expeditionary force to West Borneo to poke around and get a sense of what it was going to take to go in and raise the Dutch flag and move the political clock backwards to the pre-Napoleonic War state of affairs, and all that that entailed. They didn't have to look too hard to see the extent of the prosperity and good times that had bloomed while they were gone, and all the big and small mining towns dotted all over from Montrado in the north to Mandor in the south. The Dutch representatives still placed a great deal of faith in negotiating with the He Shun Zong Ting and Lan Fang Gong Si. Whenever these rivals met to hash things out, the Dutch were subjected to a whole litany of solemn ceremonies and rituals that had to accompany all the discussions. And to the Dutch, it was a lesson in tedium, but to the miners and their elected leaders, it was deadly serious stuff, and whenever anything was agreed upon, it was formalized with elaborately prepared documents affixed with official gongsi seals, and more often than not, whatever was agreed upon was never carved in stone, and attempts on the Chinese side would often be made to manipulate the spirit of the agreement, and this naturally infuriated the Dutch, who were already no strangers to the negotiating methods of the gongsi's By the 1820s, the population of Chinese in West Borneo had grown to more than 60,000. The ratio of men to women was 10 to 1, with the women always being their Dayak wives. The Dutch were reluctant to play hardball, knowing the Chinese, though not as well equipped as the Dutch soldiers, were still great in numbers. And they decided to be more assertive with what they wanted and use Sambas in the north as the first test case of a poll tax they wanted to levy on the 10,000 or so Chinese who lived within the borders of that sultanate. And to back up their demands, a garrison with 600 Dutch troops was set up there. And the Dutch had made it clear to the ruling sultan there that all Malays and Dayaks were under his authority and control. But the Chinese belonged to the Dutch. In November 1818, a deal was inked between the Dutch and the Sultan of Sambas to make it all official. And with that, all the Chinese living within the borders of the Sultanate of Sambas were now Dutch subjects and had to cough up certain taxes. And the way the Dutch handled everything, they sort of ambushed the Chinese and didn't give them time to prepare a plan to resist. So they acquiesced to the demands and a war between these two sides was averted. The Dutch believed they were within their rights to demand these taxes of the Chinese. I mean, the way they saw it, the Chinese were clearly better off financially than anyone else. Their gains were often perceived as ill-gotten, most often for mining in areas where they didn't have official mining rights, you know, in Malay or Dayak lands. And one other thing that the Chinese were accused of was that most of the wealth they created was simply repatriated back to China and not reinvested in West Borneo. 
by every indication, there was some very serious economic prosperity happening in West Borneo. And the Dutch, who were carrying out the analysis of the situation, figured out if they rolled this tax out to all the Gongsis in West Borneo, a small piece of this abundance added up to a hefty amount in potential taxes, travel permits, import duties, and any number of arbitrary fees. And this would provide ample funding for the Dutch presence there. But despite all the threats and implied violence that might ensue, by April 1819, the Chinese were not coming around, and rather than wait for the Dutch to come at them, they went on the attack. All-out warfare erupted after the Chinese were routed following an ambush they carried out against the Dutch fort at Pontianak. And with this out in the open, the Dutch now knew where everything stood, and that there was no longer any need to keep up good appearances. Both sides went straight to the mattresses, and on both sides, they now knew this was going to be a long, hard slog. Within the He Zong Ting, located in Montrado, things were not going as originally planned. This He Shun Alliance, as it was also called, was made up of 14 competing Gongsis who agreed to join together as one, but for a number of reasons. Bad blood often existed between the rivals within the alliance, and it started to splinter. The most notable event concerned the San Tiao Go Gongsi being forced, in 1822, to flee the He Shun Ting after coming up short in their battles with rivals within the alliance. Most notably, the Da Gang Gongsi. The San Tiao Go Gongsi was forced to depart the alliance and ended up setting themselves up in the far north in the Sultanate of Sambas, and as far as the rump He Shun Zong Ting, they remained in control of their stronghold in Montrado. The Dutch leaders, operating out of Batavia on the island of Java, were dumbfounded about why, after so much time, the revenue spigot was taking so long to start flowing in amounts that were as regular or prodigious as anticipated. It was no secret how economically sound West Borneo had become by the 1820s, and Well, all things considered, the Dutch had very little to show for themselves there. During the summer of 1822, a separate peace was negotiated between the Dutch and the Lanfang Gongsi that allowed those two rivals to live in some semblance of harmony. This, of course, involved a certain amount of money being paid to the Dutch and various other matters of an economic and political nature. And the rulers in Mandor, representing the Hakas of the Lanfang Gongsi, after careful deliberation, found this path to be the lesser of two evils. So with this one victory in hand, the Dutch then went on to deal with what remained of the He Shun Zong Ting. This meant being forced to get in between the rivalry that existed between the breakaway San Tiao Go Gongsi and the Da Gang Gongsi, who now led the much reduced He Shun Alliance. Negotiations were never easy, but trying to hammer out an agreement with the remaining Gongsis of the He Shun Alliance and with the San Tiao Go Gongsi was a major lesson in frustration. And it always came down to the same old conclusion. Unless the Dutch came at them in a more forceful way and with bigger guns, they'd remain in this endless cycle of negotiating for this pull tax. Unlike the Lanfang Gongsi, who spoke as one single entity, with the He Shun Zong Ting alliance, fractured like it was, not only was it harder to strike a deal, the Dutch even got sucked into the politics and rivalry between the two most powerful entities, San Tiao Go and Da Gang. And even within the once mighty San Tiao Go Gongsi, they didn't speak with one voice and ended up breaking into two. There was another major flare-up in August 1824 when the He Shun fighters in Montrado attacked the Dutch at the port of Sinkawang and forced them to retreat by sea. Sinkawang served as the import-export hub for Montrado. Today, most of West Borneo's Hakas live there at that port in Sinkawang. The Dutch had tried to force the He Shun alliance to its knees by taking over their port, but as long as the Mismatch continued, with hundreds of Dutch soldiers fighting against thousands of armed Chinese resistors. No progress could be made. By 1825, the Chinese in West Borneo were thinking the same thing that the Dutch were thinking about them. 
how to get rid of them, but attempts amongst the Chinese to create alliances with each other to fight the Dutch never got any traction. And the Dutch were relentless in their determination to get the Gongsis to submit to their will. And then suddenly, in 1825, another miracle for the Chinese of West Borneo happened when the Java Wars broke out that tied down the Dutch from 1825 to 1830. During that period, the Dutch soldiers fought for their lives against the rebel leader and Indonesian national hero Dipan Negoro. And with the Dutch tied up like they were for those nearly five years, the Gongsis were able to live in peace, which always meant unbridled prosperity. The Dutch had thrown everything they could at the Gongsis starting in 1818, but it was all to no avail. The Gongsis, though not as united as they had been prior to and during the Napoleonic Wars, were still too strong a force to be intimidated or taken down easily. But the Dutch were still as determined as ever to tear down this whole political, military, and administrative structure that these Chinese migrants had built with all its Republican bells and whistles and turn it into nothing more than a Chinatown in the Dutch East Indies. But this wasn't going to be easy. After a half century of slowly building up the Gongsis, all these intricate trade and commercial networks had been established throughout West Borneo and stretched to Singapore, Fujian, Guangdong, and Malaysia, and amongst Hakkas everywhere. It was too hard to tame it. The Chinese on West Borneo were too numerous and too well organized to be swatted down and tamed so easily. And one other thing, the transient nature of the Gongsi members, the men who emigrated to work the mines and engage in agriculture or commerce, now less and less of their earnings were being repatriated back to China. By the 1820s, after so many decades, a thriving Chinese community had settled in, many of whom had married Dayak wives with one or two generations of children to their name. And much of the wealth that had been created had been pumped back into the local economy. And with the establishment of Singapore in 1819 so close by, it led to a sizable jump in trade, mostly with regard to opium. The opium trade between Singapore and West Borneo was very brisk, and one of the highest value commodities being traded. In fact, other than the bare-bones necessities of life, opium had become the biggest expense for most of these miners. The economy of West Borneo was dominated at every level by the Chinese. No matter gold mining, agriculture, trade, transport, and all commercial transactions, the Gongsis were in charge. And the Dutch were still insisting to tame them and get them to submit to their authority and pay their taxes. But with the Dutch tied up fighting the Java War and dealing with the aftermath of their victory, the need to raise funds to support their whole East Indies colonial enterprise became more desperate than ever. Between 1825 and 1840, the Dutch returned to West Borneo to implement measures that pulled out all the stops to get the Chinese to submit to their authority there. All this time, going back to the beginning, the plan called for, essentially a poll tax on the Chinese in West Borneo. But after endless negotiation lasting decades that yielded far less revenue than what was hoped, and with the Chinese always outsmarting them and evading the taxation schemes, the Dutch decided to give up and try another tack. And this involved locking down the ports and hitting the Chinese where it hurt most. By now, 1820s and 30s, with Singapore online and the Dutch tied up for so many years fighting the Java War, and with the opium trade flying high, the growth in trade being transacted at the ports skyrocketed. And to make matters worse for the Dutch, while they were being tied up, the British moved in and were regularly trading at West Borneo ports. So the Dutch turned their attention to the main coastal city that served the Gongsis in the north, at Singkawang. And they instituted a flat rate 12% import duty on all goods arriving at the port there. And in addition to that, they demanded an arbitrary sum paid to them by the Gongsis as a token of respect to Dutch authority in West Borneo. The Dutch leaders in Batavia had a lot more at stake with their East Indies enterprise than what was being fought over in West Borneo. The pushback 
and resistance by these Chinese gongsis there was reflecting poorly on the Dutch as far as the other parts of their colony. They didn't want their failures in West Borneo to give inspiration to resistance groups elsewhere in the Indonesian archipelago. They still vividly recalled the sting from way back in 1662 when the forces of Kakshinga dealt them a death punch at Fort Zeelandia in Taiwan. They were very wary of any Indonesian Kaksingas rising to the fore to lead the people in expelling the Dutch. In the summer of 1850, once again, the Dutch went in and tried to force a result, but were rebuffed, leading everyone back to the negotiating table where the Gongsi negotiators again played rope-a-dope with the Dutch. How long had this been going on? It seemed going back to the very beginning, the Dutch had been unable to implement some kind of lasting solution to their best laid plans. But these republics, these very tightly controlled associations who all fought with a single-minded purpose and who simply wished to be left alone to do their thing, they refused to give in. The way they were set up, every individual had a voice, one man, one vote. And this made things even more difficult whenever negotiations with the Dutch or, you know, even during intra gongsi talks was concerned. All the Dutch could show for their efforts were taxes that were paid irregularly to them, and in numbers far below what they expected. And rather than turning the gongsis into these commercial operations that were fully taxed, they operated like a state within a state. And any requests to give up their political, military, and judicial authority remained a non-starter. On the eve of the so-called Gongsi Wars of 1850 to 1854, there were essentially three main contenders who the Dutch sought to dominate. The Dakang Gongsi was the sole power within the He Shun Zong Ting and remained the most militant and toughest nut to crack. The San Tiao Go Gongsi that had broken away from the He Shun Alliance in the 1830s and operated north of Montrado in and around the Samba Sultanate, they were the second main force. The third was the Lanfang Gongsi, or Republic, that still controlled the lands around their longtime base in Mandor. As I mentioned, they had cut a deal with the Dutch and were able to exist without the constant threat of military action visiting their lands. The Dakang and Santiago Gongsis, though once close allies, had no love lost for each other, and plenty of blood had been spilled in their rivalry. Back in 1822, the Santiago Gongsi had tried and failed in an attempt to overcome their Dakang rivals, but ended up suffering a humiliating defeat which forced them to migrate north of Montrado, leaving this stronghold of the once feared He Shun Zongting. And ever since then, the bad blood between these two former allies manifested itself in frequent battles and skirmishes, with the Dutch and Malay authorities always getting sucked in and acting as referees, rarely gaining anything of substance for their efforts. But by 1850, with the strength of the Santiago Gongsi ebbing following a breakup of the organization, the Dutch saw them as a pawn to be used to apply pressure to the Dakang and Lanfang Gongsis. And keep in mind, the Dutch had other concerns beyond taming the Chinese Gongsis in West Borneo. To the north was the increasingly powerful and potent British presence in Sarawak that was continuing to cause all kinds of pressures to the Dutch traders. Now, I don't want to wander too far from our story, but up in Sarawak, today the largest state in Malaysia, it was being very efficiently exploited by the so-called White Raja, Sir James Brooke, son of a British East India Company servant who arrived in Borneo in 1839 after providing critical assistance to the Raja of Brunei to put down an out-of-control uprising. Brooke had been able to take over part of Sarawak, and starting in the 1840s, the economic pressure put on Everything the Dutch had going in the south, from Sambas to Pontianak, was terribly intense. Operating as a standalone entity, the Santiago Gongsi could hardly defend itself like back in the day when they were one of many groups within a single alliance. By the 1850s, after being pushed around by everyone, keen to use them as a lever to put pressure on the 
Dak on Gongsi and other Chinese in Montrado, the Santiago Gongsi, who had already gone through two name changes and traumas involving their leadership and the direction they should take, simply dissolved, and by 1854 were no more. And the miners, farmers, and businessmen who were associated with Santiago went their own separate ways, to Sarawak and other parts of Southeast Asia, and no doubt some stayed put in West Borneo, where their descendants live today. What Sir James Brooke had been able to build in the north part of Borneo with his Sarawak operation acted like a dagger to the heart of Dutch trading operations, with its ideal geographic location that perfectly linked the South China Sea, the Malacca Strait, and India for the benefit of the British Empire, the Dutch felt more than ever before, once and for all, they had to secure West Borneo for themselves and either tame it or get rid of these gongsis who refused to play by Dutch rules, and worst of all were so eager to engage in all manners of trade with the British in Sarawak and Singapore. The Dutch in the 1850s saw themselves for once in a much more favorable position than ever before in West Borneo. The Santiago gongsi was gone. The Dagang, though still a force to reckon with, had downsized a lot. After so many years, the Chinese society there had become more sedentary, with roots planted and families, like I mentioned already, two and three generations deep. The mines had, for the most part by this time, had been stripped bare, and the miners had changed their line of work and become farmers or engaged in the burgeoning trading business. So they had become soft and ready to be taken down in the eyes of the Dutch. And now there was a new generation of military governors in positions of power who were more determined to do what their predecessors had failed to accomplish going back to the 18th century. And when the opening salvos of the Gongsi War were fired, the Dutch found out the Chinese who rallied around the Dak on Gongsi banner, though a far cry from what they once were, could still put up a nasty fight, and the easy victories that they were counting on didn't materialize. Even after trouncing the Dutch, the Dakgang negotiators met with their military governor, F.J. Willer, and tried to make nice and find some way to reach a peace. And after the usual period of excruciating negotiations, back and forth, an agreement was reached in January 1851 that was unprecedented in the number of concessions the Chinese made to the Dutch, even going so far as to allow the Dutch a say in the selection of leaders in Montrado, their base going back to the 18th century during the salad days of the He Shun Zong Ting. As it was in China following the Opium War, the usage of this narcotic drug in West Borneo was all pervasive, especially amongst the Chinese. And wherever there's a high demand suppliers will do their utmost to supply this market. So opium was just about the biggest business, and much to the chagrin of the Dutch, this was a business that was carried out between the traders on the British side, mainly from the port of Singapore, to the ports of West Borneo. And this was actually the main business that the Dak on Gongsi engaged in, and the Dutch had sought to reel them in by selling this Gongsi a concession to legally control the opium imports into West Borneo. The Dakgang had been running a very brazen opium smuggling operation, carrying out a very lucrative business with traders in British Singapore and Sarawak, a trade that the Dutch were trying like crazy to either quash or at least cash in on. But even within the Dakgang itself, there was no one single voice that could speak for everyone. Every time it appeared that an agreement had been reached, the Dutch would realize they had nothing, and the Gongsi negotiators were just making monkeys out of them. Those Chinese engaged in trade and agriculture were open to agreeing to a deal, but the miners were a different lot and were not amenable at all to give an inch to the Dutch. F.J. Willer, who was leading the Dutch efforts to tame the Chinese and institute the implementation of a tax revenue system, was considered too soft to touch. This is where A.J. Anderson enters the picture and took over the main decision-making with respect to dealing with the Gongsis, 
Whereas Willer was always trying to come up with incentives to bring the Chinese around, Anderson thought more in terms of military solutions to the problem. All the way into 1853, Willer had done his best to hammer out a deal. But even though the Gongsis were much diminished compared to the former power they exercised, they couldn't be forced to give in. Therefore, in June 1853, Anderson sailed to West Borneo with 1,700 troops and proceeded to blockade the ports that the Dakang depended on, most importantly, Singawang. That hit them right where it hurt, and with all hope of replenishing their ammunition and supplies, not to mention shutting down trade, it wasn't long before the Dakang negotiators were waving the white flag. By June 1854, the once impregnable He Zongting stronghold of Montrado was taken by Dutch forces. And after fruitless talks and a strong showing by the Dutch troops, by December 1854, a hopelessly divided Dakang Kongsi was forced to give in. And at the 11th hour, many of those who were willing to submit to the Dutch were threatened by those within the Dakang faction who refused to give in and branded them as traitors and even hunted them down for their refusal to fight to the finish. But the end came for the last holdouts and the once all-powerful and economically mighty He Ting was finally vanquished. And with that, the Dutch finally, after all this time and effort, were in complete control of West Borneo. The Lanfang Gongsi remained in place in Mandor, but they had long before cut a deal that kept things on an even keel between themselves and the Dutch. But in 1884, following the death of the longtime head of the Lanfang Gongsi, the Dutch moved in and thwarted any idea of replacing him and put an end to this Hakka-run organization and forced everyone to flee to Singapore, Sarawak, Sumatra, and Malaysia. I read that Singapore's great leader, Lee Kuan Yew's family, came from one of these Hakka families who left West Borneo after the demise of the Lanfang Republic. That's in dispute, I believe. The lands that made up the Lanfang Republic were taken over by the Dutch and passed out to the various sultans of Pontianak, Mempawa, and others. The Hakkas of Mandor had long ago made peace with the Dutch and reluctantly played by their rules, but there was never any love and respect that the two sides had for each other. As I mentioned in Part 1, there's no shortage of original sources, writings, and colonial records concerning this part of Dutch Indonesian history. Author Wang Tai Peng wrote an authoritative work called The Origins of Chinese Gongsi that came out in 1994. He maintained that any attempt to label these Gongsis as republics in the Eurocentric sense was misleading. Other than their system of electing their leaders, they were essentially and uniquely Chinese in how they were managed. As much as the notion that they operated like Western democracies is presented, in reality, they were far from it. Wang maintains they were run like any number of brotherhoods or secret societies in China who all shared a common cause or enterprise. The Dutch sinologist Jan Jacob Maria de Groot is perhaps the leading advocate that proffers the notion that these Gongsis were the first real republics. He referred to them as village republics formed for the purposes of governing their organization. The work I found particularly useful was written by Yuan Bingling, who wrote a very detailed work called Chinese Democracies, a study of the Gongsis of West Borneo. I'll have a link to her book at the show notes. She had concluded that these Gongsis were, quote, developed for and shaped by what must have been, for the immigrants themselves, a kind of frontier environment, which transformed their traditional social and political structures into something different from their original models, end quote. Well, if you're interested to learn more about this subject and drill down for more details, there's plenty of surviving documentation waiting for you. Okay, we are deep into extra time here, and I think between these two episodes, you got the main idea. I hope you enjoyed the free geography lesson as well. 
If this wretched pandemic ever ends, I, for one, hope I could make it over to West Kalimantan to see all this for myself. And let me give a shout out to Alexander, who has been a CHP listener for a long time, downloading from his home in the Sintang Regency, West Kalimantan. Good to have so many friends all over the world. And thanks also to the local people of Kalimantan Barat, who have taken in the episode from my YouTube channel and left behind various informative comments. Okay, me little beauties, time to pull down the curtain and pack up. New topic next time that has only been requested for the last 11 years. Finally getting around to it. Until then, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, California, where the stars are buried. See you next time, I hope, for what I'm guaranteeing will be another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.